How many of you thought you are coming to a finance NOIDA conference today morning? <laughs> so you are still in the right conference. It's not a finance NOIDA conference. It's still a agile NOIDA conference. And uh, before I scare the hell out of you, it is not, we are not going to talk about finance at all. Right? We are not going to talk about budgeting. It's not like you get up in the morning and say, yeah, I am going to go to holiday today and I am going to learn something about budgeting on a Sunday morning. Right? That's not my aim. So we are not going to talk about that. But you made my job easier because I think a lot of things that we have talked about, we are going to go a little up in the air, 30,000 feet and really talk about, and we are going to actually talk about how organizations need to look at it. And we will talk about and we will learn about from some of the organizations who have actually done some of the things, some of those horror bosses and horror stories that uh, Rina talked about. We will also, we'll also look at some of the ones that are doing some really, really awesome job here. And we will try and understand what, may, what uh, some of the people are learning from there and what can we do. And you made my job difficult because I don't think we can match, I can match the energy and the enthu and the fun that you brought in that, but I'll try my level best, right? So, uh, so we're going to talk about uh, beyond budgeting today. Anyone has heard this term before? Those who have heard, don't say anything. Okay. Because let me have my moment here, okay? So we, so we talk about, uh, we try and understand what is really beyond budgeting. Uh, I live in Bangalore. I, uh, this is a little bit of a commercial break about me. Uh, I started uh, as a freelance uh, coach. I coach organizations in innovation, agility and leadership. And uh, my book just got out. Uh, it's on Amazon. Rina talked about Amazon.com. It's there. So, it, just, it just came out three weeks back. It took me a year. It took me a year of getting up at four in the morning and writing the book. So I'm happy for the work that I did there. I started to write the next book, which is really at this point thinking, ideating, iterating on agile cultures, human values, people, how do we, why do we do the things that we do and so on and so forth. So if you have any ideas, let me know. Okay, with that I just want to get started directly to the subject. Anyone knows this picture, this bank, this location, which country this could be from? Germany. Germany. Okay, bank, I, I think the word bank does look like that and you can see some women who are probably standing at an ATM over there. Okay. Uh, it's not Germany, it's uh, Sweden. It's actually a Swedish bank, Handelsbanken. And this is the story of a bank which is the most unusual bank that you would have heard of. And let me tell you some of the stories. The story is so big that I have to refer to my notes actually. So this was actually started in 1871. And this bank today has about 800 branches in 24 countries. And it has only about 11,000 employees. So you can imagine, this is actually the oldest bank that is, oldest company that is listed on the Stockholm Exchange. And this bank is so unusual that in 1971, it decided to abandon budgeting. It decided, it told its people that, hey, we are not going to mess into your daily affairs and they told all the branches that you are the bank. They said there is no concept of a headquarters. You guys are going to run the bank. You are going to run the branch the way the banks are run. So you guys are going to figure out how you run a bank. Very unusual approach. So unusual that these guys have the highest return on equity among their peer banks. In the 2008 uh, meltdown, these, this bank was the only bank in, uh, I guess in Europe, or at least in Sweden, that did not require any kind of bailout or intervention. It was so successful. So whatever they are doing is not just for keeping the people busy, it's also showing the results to them. They have only one mantra, respect for people. Whether it is a customer or an employee, respect for the people, that's all they do. So it's a very unusual story and something that's going to warm your heart actually as you read about it, what they do and what they kind of, uh, uh, how they do things and so on. That is, that is going to be one of the things that I'm going to talk about and what we have been doing, uh, there, there are a lot of researchers who have been learning from, hey, what is it that these guys have done so unusual that actually allows us, can we learn something from there, are there lessons that we can replicate from this to another place here. So, now, before that, let me just come to a question there. All, how many of you are following or, or following or doing or being or in some shape or form embracing Agile? Can you raise your hand? 
Okay, I see majority of the people, then 99% of the people probably. Can you also once again, if I can, if you can uh, please do that, how many of you believe that your organizational processes, mindsets at the org level are orthogonal or, or let, let me turn it around. How many of you believe that your organizational mental models are aligned to the values of agility? Can you please raise your hands? I get two, I can see two or three hands here. Why is it so? Why is it that we have 99% of the people in this room saying that we follow agile, we are really being agile here, we are really doing it at the team level, but the moment I flip the question around at the org level, we have less than three hands here. And that's the question that I want to answer here, is one of the biggest challenges that we are seeing here is because of the impedance mismatch between theory X and theory Y. Anyone familiar with theory X and theory Y here? I see one hand here. Thank you, Victor. And I, one more. So, Douglas McGregor talked about this theory X and theory Y. Theory X was really all about, theory X believes that, hey, people are lazy bumps. These guys are really trying to find, they are slackers, they are lazy people, they don't like to work, they have to be supervised. You know what? They even have to pay them to get them to work. It's like that bad. They don't want to do anything. And then there was this gentleman, Douglas McGregor, in, in the late 50s, he came up with this fantastic idea. He wrote a paper in the book beyond, uh, after that, The Human Side of Enterprise, in which he came up with this theory X concept, the theory Y. And the theory Y is people are all nice people. We all like to be in the, we all like to work, we all like to collaborate, we all like to be nice to each other, we all like to be the ray of sunshine to people, we all like to, uh, to collaborate and work on the common problems. In sense, we, we have intrinsic motivation for us to come to work and do something there. We are not looking only for the extrinsic motivation. Now what has happened over a period of time is that we are realizing that we are actually doing with ideas like Agile and multiple other ideas. We kind of have a theory why, but we are still trying to put a square peg in a round hole. Because the leadership or the ideas that we are trying to bring in are, are more theory why, but the management systems that we are still trying to, to kind of force fit into them are round goals. And that's the biggest problem that we are doing. So let's, let's learn about how some of the organizations have dealt with the problem of creating the right impedance match between these two, the leadership and the management, right? Okay, so before that, let me just, some of you might be wondering why am I talking about budget here? I mean, I'm, I, Agile has nothing. Have you heard of the word? Budget in any of the Scrum Guide or Agile Manifesto or anywhere? No. I, I believe nobody has read that, right? So what is it that we are really talking about? How, what, what has budget got to do with that? Let, just, just hold your disbelief for a moment and let me just try and come to the point here. Let's look at some of these quotations. Bob Moots, ex-CEO Chrysler. The budget is a tool of repression rather than innovation. Are we sure that we have nobody from finance community here? Dr. Jan Wallander, Honorary President, Svenska Handels Bank, and this is the bank that... So Jan Wallander was the guy actually who did most radical thing unimaginable in 1971 when he said, this bank will not have any budgeting process. This bank will decide, people will decide what is right for them, not a head office, not the boss, not the CEO, not the company's strategy office. He said, budget is an, budgeting is an unnecessary evil. Mark the words carefully, it's an unnecessary evil, it's not a necessary evil. And Jack Welsh, the budget is the bane of corporate America. I think a lot of, in the last 30, 40 years, a lot of people have, have been doing a research not from the grassroots revolution that Agile did, but really from the top-down revolution and saying, hey, something is wrong with the organizations. Something is wrong in the way we are running the businesses. Something is wrong in the way we are uh, putting controls on people and the way we are incentivizing people, and that has to stop. And they have been able to, to they believe that budgeting is actually the culprit of that. So let's just understand what budgeting, how the old budgeting model was and why it has some uh, limitations. So this is the old budgeting model. We really started with mission statements, strategic planning, budgeting, going to the budgets, controlling. And then everything was essentially all about keeping on track. How many people here are in some shape or form involved in the budgeting process? Anybody here? I see a few hands going. 
please go up to your manager and ask them. If, if your managers at some time in a year are missing for three or four months, that means they are busy in the budgeting process. Typically, it has taken, it takes on an average four to five months of time and effort for budgeting. In 1998, they did a research and they found, they did a benchmarking and they found for every billion dollar of revenue, 25,000 percent days of company's effort is going only in budgeting. <coughs> IBM in 1970s, I don't remember the exact year, had 3,000 people who were in the strategic bureaucracy of the organization. 1.2 billion dollars was going only in feeding the white elephant of these 3,000 people. So much so, that their annual planning used to take 18 months. <coughs> annual planning taking 18 months. Imagine, that's what they, come, they had come to, right? So that's the problem that we had with this. Because in the new changing world, none of these things really mattered. We were not talking about stable targets. We were not talking about moving, uh, we, 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 start, we moved from uh, static to the moving targets here. We went to the point where a lot of that data point that we were looking at were kind of an exercise in futility. They were meaningless, but we were still just going through the motion. We were setting arbitrary timelines. We were saying, okay, we have to do this kind of a thing. Let's set an annual budget. The annual budget is going to dictate how people behave. It led to the performance contract because it said, hey, this is your annual budget. You have half a million dollars and you have to get the revenue of five million dollars. This is what I expect from you. This is your playbook. Go and run with that. It created the kind of challenges and companies after companies People after people, they got burnt. We have Enrons and the world comps of the world as so many examples where people were only being told that if you don't really ship something, you will be shipped out. And people were only forced to follow the fixed targets there. So that's the kind of a world that, had, that was happening. And some of these companies started saying that maybe budgeting is the problem. So let's first understand which part of budgeting we are really talking about here. The word budgeting is not used in the narrow sense of planning and control, but it's a generic term for the traditional command and control management model. With the annual budget process at its core, in this context it describes both a management culture and a performance management system. So we're looking at two things here. It's actually a management system that is leading to a top-down command and control, and it's the old saying, the one who has the money gets, gets their say, right? So if, if I'm the guy who say, I'm going to give you 100 rupees and I'm going to give you 200 rupees, you are, I'm actually already setting you up for whatever it's going to be, a success or a failure. You don't really have too much of room for maneuvering here, right? So it's a top-down command and control manner. You could be doing a lot of local optimizations, I don't care, because I've already set the high-level conditions that you are, going to, you are going to really behave and operate in those uh, conditions there. So it not only created a context for management culture, it even drove down the, it was, it was kind of a dumping down of the, of the whole performance management system. We started telling, okay, now this is what you have to do and if you can't, cannot deliver, you don't need to be here. So it came to the point where any kind of an empowerment from a grassroots level was uh, a wishful thinking at its, at its best. Because people can keep doing, I mean look at it this way. Have you heard of those agile, uh, I, I have done a lot of analysis on that data. There are some of the agile gurus, very respected agile gurus, whose marketing brochure says that you will get 1,000 times performance, 1,000 percentage performance improvement, 10 times performance improvement, 20 times performance improvement if you use Agile and Scrum. Have you seen some of those data points? I, I, so I was curious to know what's really happening to these companies. Can we understand a little more about it? So I went to Standard & Poor 500 Index. S&P 500 Index is the, is the world's 500 largest publicly traded companies on New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. And I looked at their profitability. And I found their profitability. Can you guess what is the profit margin of the, the average profit margin of S&P 500 companies? Any guesses? 10%. It's about 15%. So I said on one hand we are saying that, that this whole agile thing is going to give me 10 times, 20 times productivity and all that things. And guess what? When all these large corporations, when they actually go, they are really talking about 10% and 12% uh, profitability. So where is it getting evaporated really? Where is it really, uh, where, where are we losing it? And I, 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 when, I, when, I was, when I started reading about beyond budgeting, I thought I was fine, I was getting closer to that answer. I think there is a clear cut impedance mismatch between what we can accomplish and what we have allowed the team to accomplish 
versus what the what the headquarters or what the CEO office thinks the team should be accomplishing. Right? So that's where the whole genesis of budgeting is. So what is beyond budgeting then? What does it mean? Should we not do any budgeting? If budgeting is the culprit, that means we should stop doing it. Let's look a little, a little before that. Beyond budgeting means beyond command and control towards a management model that is more empowered and adaptive. Does it sound like agile? Does it sound like agile in your teams? That's what we are really seeing. So this is actually a movement that started from the finance side of the equation into the organizations which, are, which knew nothing about Agile, which knew, knew nothing about extreme programming or, or any of the stuff, Scrum. But they started looking at it top down and saying, hey, how do we fix it? And we have to probably move away from the command and control to something that's more empowered and adaptive. Think of the handles bank and right, which I talked about. Every branch is a bank. Now, can you imagine that kind of a thing? They have 800 branches in 24 countries. Every branch is a bank. I think it's, it's uh, Naresh was yesterday talking about some of the examples he was giving where he said, any of my team members is free to talk about it. I think that's an empowerment at the team level, a, a great example of that. Now imagine being able to do it at a level of a company where you have 11,000 employees in 24 countries, 800 branches, and being able to go to all the branches and tell them, you can do whatever you want to do. Of course, they have some high level operative guidance on that. But then at the end of the day, the branch is still free and expected to do serve their customers. In fact, they choose people and they make their policy. There is no central budget in handles back and bank. And. So if I am the if I am the branch manager of a local branch and you guys are, I know I know your problems and you know me personally, I know you personally. So it's like the good old village type of a thing. That's what these guys have replicated at scale by doing the beyond budgeting there. And beyond budgeting is about rethinking how do we manage organizations in a post-industrial world where innovative management models represent the only sustainable competitive advantage. Guess what? Tools are available. Is, is, do you think there is a tool that you or your company has that nobody else in the world can, can get their hands on? All tools are for sale or for free download, whichever you want to do. Is there a method or a process that is a secret weapon of somebody? Do you, do you sincerely believe that there is a company in the world that actually has a secret process, method or tool? I don't believe so. I believe the only thing that is secret about a company is its mindset, its culture, how they attack the problems, how do they really look at them, how do they really innovate about it, what kind of management models do they have to support the innovation that they have, right? And it, it also is about releasing people from the burdens of stifling bureaucracy and suffocating control systems, trusting them with the information and giving them time to think, reflect, share, learn and improve. So that is the kind of a context that we are talking about when we talk about beyond budgeting. So what is beyond budgeting? This is a fantastic book that came out, uh, it's, it's a Harvard Business Press book, came out in 2003, Jeremy Hope, Robin Fraser. And what they say is, beyond budgeting is a positive idea, it's not a negative idea. First of all, don't think that hey, something is wrong with budgeting. What we are saying is, beyond budgeting is a positive <coughs> idea that uses the abandonment of budgeting. That means we are abandoning budgeting, definitely by now, as a trigger for improving the entire management control process. We are not substituting that by something equally evil. We are substituting that with free controls. We are substituting that with peer controls. We are substituting that with decentralization. We are substituting that with things that make people more empowered, more engaged, more happy, and, and, and are more likely to perform. That's the kind of a thing. Before I jump into the model and talk about some of it, just a, a big warning. It's a model, it's not a tool. Don't think that there is a process like a CMMI that you can just follow or a tool that you can just go and run with that. It's a model, it's a thinking. It's, it's something that has to evolve around the organization. Right? Now, it, so, so, so in 2011 they came together, so people have been studying it for the last 30-40 years and there were bits and pieces of that. Because this was, like I, I talked about, uh, the, the, the Handels Banken was basically doing that since 1971 uh, and there were other companies there, there are companies in Denmark, there are companies in, uh, uh, in France, uh, there is a company. Uh, so people, and people were starting to cull that together and say, okay, what does it really mean? And they came up with these 12 principles in, in 2011. Uh, two big buckets, leadership and process. Within leadership, governance and transparency, accountable teams. And within process, goals and rewards and planning and controls. 
The small print is too small, so I have one slide for each one of them. I'll quickly run over, uh, run through each of these slides, uh, and I'll just kind of talk about all the 12 principles here. First one, start with the values. Bind, uh, bind people to common cause, not a central plan. They said there's no beauty, there's no fun in really saying there's, a, there's this uh, street jacketing of everything and saying, no, this is the plan, everybody has to do that kind of a thing. But I remember, so I, I have, I have uh, like two banks where, uh, very close to where I live. One of them is a nationalized bank, a Canberra bank. So my wife and I, we went there to open an account there. And we were just talking to and you can imagine what, what a nationalized bank would be like. It's, they said, no sir, you have to do this, this, and, and, and after that, we knew that the only way we can get the bank done is that if you open a fixed deposit, right? It was a coercive power at its best, actually. I mean, she, she, it was not as if she directly said that, no, you cannot open a bank, but it was very clear that, no, you have to do that. Then I was talking to, an, uh, to the HDFC bank where I operate my, my uh, current account. And uh, I was talking to that guy, sir, I am very busy nowadays. That guy actually goes home at 9 o'clock. I said, wait, what has happened there? Sir, HDFC Bank has started a new initiative. We are going to open a branch in every half a kilometer in all the cities. I said, wow, that looks good. You guys must be getting a lot of business. Sir, the other catch is they will fund us for the first one year. After that, we have to get a minimum amount of business. If, I can, if we cannot give minimum business, we will not be allowed to get more staff. So now you see what's happening there? These guys are burning at both ends. These guys are working hard to get the clients, and if they cannot get the clients, then they have to manage with the less staff that they have. So even though that's a great idea about it, it's operating under a kind of a very stringent bu uh, the bucket, which assumes that every half a kilometer in a city like Bangalore or any other city in India, there will be same market conditions, there will be same uh, uh, acceptance of HDFC as a, as, a, as a bank solution. Maybe there are more chances of somebody doing business in one area, maybe there are less area. I mean, look at the coffee day pricing. I don't know if any of you have noticed it uh, very detailed, but coffee day pricing is a great example of how he uses that. His prices are different all over India. A cappuccino is going to cost you different in Bangalore airport versus Delhi airport versus Indranagar versus uh, maybe Noida. His profit margin is fixed. He adjusts the prices based on the land prices there. So he is never in losses. Then that's why the prices vary. Now, a HDFC bank on one hand is not able to do that kind of a thing because it has a strict mandate because there is central plan there. Everybody has to follow that. But imagine something like a handles bank. They would say, okay, you guys are in that. Explore the market. Understand what it is. Your, uh, we will allow you to make your own things depending on how business is coming. So if the business is coming by trucks, then you can hire more staff. That's up to you. You have to maintain your profitability. We don't really care about it by saying that you have to operate within this box. We are going to only tell you a common cause. This is what we really want to do. And, and the way we believe it can be done is by establishing every branch as a bank. We will give you the empowerment for that, but you will have to display the accountability for that. So that's the kind of a thing. Do you see a difference there? Right? Okay, let's keep moving. Governance. Govern through shared values and sound judgment, not detailed rules and regulations. I remember reading some time back, uh, I, I believe it's in Malaysian army. I, I could be wrong on that one, but uh, I, um, if, if, if my memory serves me right, that's what it is. I believe that the highest uh, military award in Malaysian army can only be given to a person who acts on his judgment, a soldier who acts on his judgment right there on the battlefield. Not while following the instruction, but by thinking on his own. I mean, that's a kind of a value system that we are looking for. That's a kind of a thing. How many of us would actually have something on our KRA written that says, we are not going to give you detailed rules and regulations, use your judgment. And we will see how, how it comes, right? Half of the people would be scared of getting fired there because they'll say, no, oh, what, oh, you're setting me up for failure because you are just hiding something from me. You're just finding a way to, to, to basically set me up, right? But that's exactly what these companies are doing. They are saying, we are just going to create shared values and, and use your sound judgment. And how many of you have uh, uh, travel policies in your company that says, only one line that says, travel expenses as per your judgment? Anybody here? Thumbs up to those. I work for company. I, in fact, we had that. And I remember I was at Siemens 20 years back. We actually wrote down that policy for at Siemens Bangalore. We said travel is on actual use your judgment. In McAfee, we did the same kind of a thing, use your judgment. We actually wrote it down in one piece of line. 
business class, economy class, the cattle class, should you do this, should you stay at a $400 hotel, $200, use your judgment. We want to, if, if I cannot trust you in, on your judgment, how am I going to trust your software? Right? I think that it is, to me it's as fundamental as that. Transparency. Make information open and transparent, don't restrict and control it. Uh, there are companies, I am not able to get, I, I remember reading about some of them, where the, where the meetings, anybody is allowed to walk into any meeting in those companies. There is no information that is confidential. There are companies where even the salaries are not confidential. Some of you might have heard of Ricardo Sembler, his famous book Maverick. The guy who runs Semco, which is a Brazilian uh, uh, steel company, they have no org chart, they have no managers, they have everybody's salary is known to each other, right? If they ever have to make an org chart, they make it on a piece of uh, some scrap paper so that they can immediately discard it after they make it. Because they don't want to have that. They don't believe that's the right thing for them, right? So keep the information open and transparent, make sure that people understand what we are doing, don't really hide any information. Uh, there might be temptations that people say, hey, it's confidential information, no, we cannot do it. Trust your people. Trust is, I think, the biggest binding force that we have known to, to mankind, right? Teams, organize around a seamless network or account of accountable teams, not centralized functions. Account team says, sir, this is not my job, I go to finance team. Finance team, no, 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 no we cannot give it, tell it to you, go to, go to procurement. Procurement says, sends it to, no, no, we haven't got the approval from the, uh, from the budgeting office. We have like five different uh, people who need to be in the room just in order to make a decision or to execute on a decision there. What we are saying here is, organize around the seamless network of accountable teams. Build accountability in the teams and not create silos. The only thing the silos do is, pass it on to somebody else. It's not my problem. It's look at them. I mean, the whole finger pointing and, and the blame game uh, goes on with that. Trust. To me, this is the this is this is the ether. This has to be there in the organization everywhere. This is something that has to really gel everything together. Trust the teams to regulate their performance. Don't micromanage them. What happens when the goals are written for people? The goals are written in such a manner that hey, you have to do da 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 da. The boss gives you down on the on the list of all the goals. These guys say we don't want we don't believe that's the right way of doing it. We believe there are better ways of doing it. Trust the team. Then figure out what is the right way of doing it. Imagine a handles bank and 800, uh, in fact, and, uh, they, they do a very interesting thing. I believe that by design and handles bank and what they do is, they have, so they do have a little bit of a hierarchy because 800 banks, if they all start reporting to one uh, team or office, they would have chaos there. So they do have this whole notion of uh, regional managers. So they have some regions and based on that, can you guess how many, uh, how many banks would fall under one regional manager? Any guess? They have 800 branches. How many branches do you think would fall under one regional manager? Any guess? 10. 10, good start. Anything else? 50. 50 is almost correct. 50, 55. You know why? Because that guy will be so busy with 55 banks, he cannot micromanage them. <laughs> people micromanage when they have 5 or 7 or 10 people. If you have 200 people reporting to you, you cannot micromanage them. So by design, they have built it in such a manner that this guy is, is running uh, from, from morning till evening, has no time to micromanage those branches. Right? It's kind of ironic, but that's probably a little bit of fun that they have brought in that. Accountability. Like base accountability on holistic criteria and peer reviews, not on hierarchical relationships. What do we try to do when we create a self-organizing team at a team level? Most of the time, I'm seeing 90, 99% of you are following agile in some shape or form. How do you sell it to the people that say, so who's going to be, who's going to make the commitment? The team. Who's going to be responsible if the, if the goals are not met? Team. Who's going to uh, be blamed, uh, if at all blame is the right word there, to be blamed if the goals are not met? Team. It's like, come on, is, who's this team, right? It's, it's, it's a difficult, it's a hard sell for people who are not used to the whole idea there. And that's what these guys are trying to say that build it on peer uh, uh, reviews, on the peer relationships, not on the hierarchy. That's the kind of accountability they are doing, right? Goals. This is a very interesting one. Set ambitious medium term goals, not short term fixed targets. So they don't believe in setting fixed targets. There are, there's a little bit of stretch goal. Don't get it wrong that these uh, beyond budgeting means easy money. 
Beyond budgeting is not about saying that it's a, it's, it's, it's like a free food. There is a higher level of accountability they are putting in. But they, that higher level of accountability is coming from the individuals who are being, uh, who are being uh, bestowed or uh, who, who, are, who are being trusted with more accountability and more uh, uh, responsibility in the system. So it's, there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? So when, when people are trusting, they are expecting, okay, so you tell me what you can do for us, that kind of a thing. We are not going to impose anything for you. But don't get it wrong that we have opened an NGO here and all we are doing is getting people and giving them free salary. That's not what it's about. It's about setting a very different kind of uh, uh, trust and, 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 and a relation at the organization where we, it's like the Steve Jobs saying, we hire smart people not because we can tell them what to do, but so that they can tell us what to do. There is a very nice tweet that I am always reminded of. It's a great tweet. Somebody tweeted, I don't remember the original author of that tweeter. He said, office is the place where we treat adults like children. Do you agree? And that's what we actually do. I mean, Rina talked about a lot of stuff, how people really come there and all. Why does the whole thing, it's like you come bubbling with energy, you take, you take another extra five minutes for the shower that day on the day one and you come there and freshly smelling and all that thing and suddenly, then some, suddenly shh, everything comes down. No, you cannot do this, you cannot copy on this, you have to have, you cannot put USB drive on your uh, uh, laptop, you cannot download any software, forget about Facebook at work. How many people would, uh, can relate to that? Like no Facebook at work? Okay, few people, yeah. I am I'm glad to see more hands are down than up actually. Because it's, it's improving, but yes, things have been, things are taking time to change there. Rewards, again very interesting. Waste rewards on relative performance, not on meeting fixed targets. They are very clear. We don't believe that setting fixed targets is something which is a good thing. Based on relative targets. So what did you do last, last quarter? What did you do last, how much do you want to accomplish? So they have actually, Handel's Bank has a very nice system. They have abolished the concept of bonus. There is no concept of bonus in that company. Bonus is like free money, to be honest. They said, we, instead of bonus, we believe in profit sharing. So what happens is everybody has a profit sharing, and one third of, when they achieve the, when, when they exceed the quota of the uh, profit sharing, then one third of that goes into a common pool. So it's like a family kind of a thing there. Because there might be times when, you know what, that group was really performing very well, but they've fallen on hard times last, last quarter, something is going wrong with them. Won't we bail them out if we were a family? Or we are going to say, no, nothing doing, numbers are more important to me, I don't care about people. That bank chooses not to have that line of thought. That bank chooses to say, we understand there will be fluctuation, there will be, in fact, we are designing beyond budgeting for variability, for fluctuations in, in, the, in the business cycles. So we believe that it, for example, Chennai got a lot of floods in the last two, two or three weeks. If you were a bank or any business which had foot soldiers who were selling something, would you be raising, would you be uh, having the same level of expectations from that workforce in Chennai? I think it would be extremely unfortunate if anyone were to do that, right? And what should rest of the workforce, uh, their colleagues do in the rest of India? Should they just say, oh guys, okay, now uh, don't talk to us, come and meet your target, then we'll talk about it. Or they will say, hey guys, we totally get it. We will do something. We, we, I, I know we, I cannot be there with you and hold your hand and be with you guys at this point in time, but my heart is with you. I am totally with you guys. We will do whatever it can do. Right? That's the kind of a thing we are talking about. That's how we build great organizations. We don't build great organizations by just cutting corners somewhere here and there and treating people like, treating people like resources. I mean, that's one word I will say, pet peeve, human resources. That the, the, the bigger bigger pet peeve than that is actually, uh, how many of you have heard, I won't embarrass your CEOs, but how many of you have heard CEOs say, people are our biggest resource? <laughs> Raise your hand. Any company CEO or anywhere in the press, right? There are two fallacies in that. First, first of all, people are not your. This is mine. My cell phone is mine. But can I say that people are mine? I think that would be extremely unfair. We are free willing. Free thinking, free willing individuals. Respect people. We are not trees. We are not objects that can be bought and placed somewhere. We are people. If we don't understand people, go back to the dictionary, go back to the class. Understand what is people all about. People are not your, number one. Resources. What is a resource? A resource is something that I can buy, sell, pawn, 
put it on rent, put it on display. People are not meant for that. So how can people be our best, biggest resource? I think we have to correct our vocabulary. And I, I, I totally get it, but when Rina was saying, change your thinking. Because when you change your thinking, it's going to change your behavior. Do you believe that you want to stop calling human as resources from tomorrow? How many are with me? Thanks a lot. We have a room full of people who want to change the world. I am sure we will do something better. So, planning. Make planning a continuous and inclusive process and not a top-down level event. As I was telling, there was a time at IBM in 17 when it went to the point of annual planning being an 18-month affair. I mean, why should it be? Right? That kind of a thing there. So it should be a continuous planning, inclusive process. Make sure that people are in that. Most of the time it's like, okay, you have a packet that comes, you fill in the Excel sheet, sends you, sends it back, goes to the next level manager. There's a roll-up happening, there are cuts happening. Again, roll-up, again cuts. Finally, you get a number that you say, is that what we are getting this year? And then whatever number we get after five months of struggle, guess what happens to that number? It is taken as entitlement. I used to work in government long back, I used to work in defense and that's true for all the government functions. March is the busiest month in any government agency. You know why? Because there is a surplus budget. If you don't use the budget, you don't get that money next year. So you have to buy anything that comes to your mind, all the fancy stuff that comes to your mind, you have to buy it. That's the way we have treated budgeting for last, I don't know, I mean I, I saw this back in 91 when I started working for defense. Hey, that's how we are using budget. And I've seen in corporate also the same kind of a thinking. I mean, I was working for this, this large uh, Bay Area company and it's like, okay, you don't use the budget, you don't get the budget next year. Now, obviously, we cannot go up and buy fancy uh, furniture, but then that shows the mindset that we have from a finance point of view, right? Coordination. Coordinate interactions dynamically, not through annual budgets. Again, what they are saying is annual budgets tend to have a uh, they are kind of a rate limiting factor. They align people's behavior, they align people's action, they align people's plan, they align execution of the strategy because of the budgeting. You have, you have 20 headcounts, you have, five, you have, you have uh, uh, 50, uh, 50,000 rupees, you can do this much of it. Oh no, your, your budget is this much, so you can only party in this place there. Right? I mean, uh, what are we talking about? If we are, uh, are we not willing to treat people as individuals who understand their business and will make the right decision when, when, when given the right opportunity to do so. We, we actually templatize the entire behavior. So we say, no, you cannot do this, you cannot do this, you cannot do this. The don't do list looks bigger than the do list actually. Right? So that's the kind of a thing that, uh, so resources. Make resources available just in time, not just in case. That's a very impactful one. Most of the time we say, hey, just in case, oh no, oh no, I think let's do that thing, I think we'll need this. Why not have it just in time? Why not? I mean, today's, today's market can supply you anything, literally just in time. Well, you'll have to work harder to make sure that happens there, but why do you want to stuff your inventory there by just in case kind of a thinking there, right? Just because you have the budget doesn't mean that you actually go out and do that kind of stuff. If some of, many of you might be following the whole startup landscape in India today. Three years back, all those uh, big uh, 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 startups, housing.com and bunch of other ones, where there was like, all beautiful romantic stories about how good they are and they are hiring and all that thing. Today they are firing people, right? unceremoniously firing people. There is no headline grabbing happening on that. There is unceremoniously hiring people. Why do you need to do that? I mean I was surprised actually Tiny Owl has what, 500, 300 people or something. I said okay, fine it's an app there, fine there. With 300 people? How many people WhatsApp had when they sold it for 19 billion dollars? <coughs> Probably 50 people working in a small garage, uh, they didn't even, I mean, the, the address to WhatsApp office was like, there was that board uh, outside a warehouse that said, take the left turn and use the back door. As unsexy office as it could be. Why do you need to splurge money? So these companies, make no mistake, when they talk about beyond budgeting, they are extremely cost conscious. They are extremely frugal in what they do. And, and, and so, so they are not really taking a free ride on the money. Control, base controls on base controls on fast and frequent feedback, not on budget variance. How is typically the in the in the whole budgeting cycle, how do we put the controls? Oh no, you are above budget there, five percent, we'll have to do something there. What do we do? No, we are going to freeze the hiring this quarter. I mean I worked for a company for four years where I worked there, Q 
one budgets are frozen. Q2 travel is frozen. Q3 hiring is frozen. Q4 layoffs. I saw that for four years. What are we doing? Why we cannot come out of that madness? Well, what stops us from really following a more sensible approach to doing that? So, not really do based on the budget variances, but keep having fast and frequent feedback. What is it that we are really doing? Are we in the business of hiring and firing people? Or are we in the business of serving the customers? Let's, let's get that right. So, these were the 12 principles. And finally, I just want to talk about another uh, company. Has anyone heard of Stat Oil? It's a Norwegian oil company. I think its revenues are probably about 100 billion dollars or give or take a few 10 billion dollars here and there. Uh, they, are, they are like Fortune 50 company kind of a thing. And that's a company which is very unusual because they actually in 2005 abolished traditional budgeting. And in 2010 they kicked the calendar to help with the annual calendar. We don't believe in annual planning, we don't believe in annual calendar. We are going to follow the principles of beyond budgeting. <coughs> this is a company not it's great because it's a hundred billion dollar company. It's actually the largest oil company in Norway. It is not a company which is great because it's a fortune 50 or it is number seven in innovation list also. It's also a company which is number one in the world today on corporate social responsibility. So it's a company with a conscience. It's not just about doing something just for the sake of business. It's a very holistic way in which this company is doing things. Right? Read up as much as you can about Strat Oil because I personally find it extremely uh, uh, rejuvenating to read about some, some places like Handels Bankern or, or, or uh, Strat Oil for example. Okay, let's come to the last slide here. So now we are doing Agile at team level and this new thingy at the art level. Uh, do we see any connect there? What's really happening there? I just come and take you through a new, totally different journey which doesn't seem to have anything with, uh, to do with what we do agile there and so on, right? I think there are some commonalities. They have compatible organizational values. They have a respect for people. They believe in accountability. They believe in shared values. They believe in uh, giving the, the right like, uh, amount of freedom uh, and operator freedom and let the team decide, right? I mean, how would you do, would you want to uh, do performance appraisal for your agile teams using the bell curve and the stack ranking and so on? Or would you rather say that, how do you look at the way teams improve their velocity, whether you love it or hate it, how do you see the performance of an agile team? You don't want to compare, oh, your velocity is 20, yours is 30, yours is only 5. I mean, they might have only two team members, for first of all, right? So there's nothing wrong in that. Secondly, it's like, I want to know, okay, how are you today compared to what you were six months back? And not what you what I'm comparing both of you, because your contexts are totally different there, right? And that's where we are getting it wrong once again. So I think the true agility, if we really go by the tenets of agility, we are really basically talking about the same things. We are just elevating the, the same core values at a team level to really at the organization level and talking about them. They are complementary to each other. One talks about really a lot of inside the team. One talks about outside the team, inside the organization, how do we really run the big system. It is inevitable that we will have big systems. When you have a 20,000 people company or a 80,000 people company, you will have some big infrastructure to manage. You are not going to have 20,000 or, or 3,000 teams of 7 people each, come what may. You will have to have some coordination, you will have to have some functions to roll it up. The key thing is, how many of us are willing to accept the fact that management is an overhead? I used to work for a company, I was a director there many years back. The CEO of the company used to write a mail to all of us. Dear managers and overheads. <laughs> Believe me, he actually used to address us like that. It was not his, he, he was not poking fun at us, but he was actually reminding us that as managers, you guys are overheads. Please understand that. That's an important thing because, I mean, I, I, I've been blessed in my career that in 2007 I took a call when I was running India operations. I moved away from a, as a general manager to an individual contributor. And for seven years as a VP role, I was an individual contributor. And I have never felt more empowered in my life than ever, than having 200 people report to me. We can talk about it later in the day if you don't believe it, but I'll be, but I personally found that the true power, I think you talked about the informal power, you don't need a title, you don't need a corner office, you don't need a reserved parking lot, you don't need people calling you sir or ma'am, you don't need uh, to wear special clothes. You have to believe that you can add value. Are you, are you a servant leader? Can you really help your people? I think those are some of the things that we are looking at here. 
And finally, decision making by empiricism. We are not talking, we are not taking a, 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 a Hail Mary way of doing projects here, right? In Agile, we don't do a Hail Mary style of project management. Kick the ball and then you are chanting Hail Mary, Hail Mary. The ball might go there and land in the goal there. That's not the Agile way of doing it, right? We are adjusting and adapting our plans constantly. We are looking at what is the best way to reach the goal, given the fact that we don't know how we are going to get there. We know the general direction, right? It's, it's, it's like the Swiss Army man was saying that says, when the map and the terrain disagree, trust the terrain. It says clearly, common sense, they had to write it down. If the map and the terrain disagree, trust the terrain, don't trust the map, right? The problem is a lot of us have been given map by our trainers and coaches and said, go and follow this map. Where all, you, all they had to tell you was, if there is a disagreement between map and terrain, trust the terrain. That's true agility in my point of view, right? So anyway, let me conclude it. What, about, what I think, uh, just to summarize it, beyond budgeting definitely is, a, is an idea that actually goes to the whole root of how do we really even fund those arteries and veins of the organization? How do we really make sure that we are staffing with the people who then are forced to follow, right? In design, as we say, form follows the function. That kind of a thing is happening in organizations as well. Because we have funded them, because we have created the uh, responsibility, because we have done the job description, it's not a surprise that we end up seeing people's behavior the way we end up seeing them. And then it becomes extremely difficult to expect them to achieve local optimization and saying, now you become self-organizing. It's like there are too many other factors around, there are restraining forces in the organization which are not letting it do. So these set of people, the beyond budgeting round table and uh, a lot of folks feel that there is little people in the trenches can do. They can improve their behavior, they can change their mindset, but as we have seen uh, uh, from, uh, from various theories, Levitt's theory, Levitt theory, that environment also plays a big effect on people's performance. So if we don't change the environment, we are never going to get to the point of creating truly agile organizations. And these people, unknown to the whole agile, uh, they, they didn't know anything about agile transformation, agile manifesto or anything. They just said okay, there has to be a better way of improving the organizational effectiveness, which is what they have ended up creating there. Right? This book is a fantastic book. I would recommend it's on Amazon. You can buy an e-book. Great book. I'm sure it's going to change you forever when you start reading more about this. Because it will give you the power of the idea. It will give you the belief that you can change it. And I just want to end it with one word that I think is the most beautiful word in English language. And that word is known as meliorism or being melioristic. Anyone has heard of that word before? Melioristic means it is a belief that by human intervention we can change things, we can improve things. I think to me agility is all about being melioristic. It is not a, about accepting the fate and saying that's what, I cannot do anything more than that, it's not my job, that's not what I'm supposed to do, it's, uh, I'm not paid for this, but it's actually believing that with my intervention I can change the world, I can do something about it. I'll stop here and I'll close it down. I don't know if I have any time yet, but if there's any, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions? At the pain points of uh, many of the enterprises, uh, especially at the pro program portfolio and the budgeting areas, uh, do you have any more examples where at an enterprise level uh, the budgeting has gone towards more of an agile way uh, which complements at the, at the team level? Uh, budgeting that has got at, at, at an organization, I don't know any personal examples. I know the case studies that are there in the public domain. That's, I mean if you go to bbrt.org, there are enough case studies available there which talk about these, uh, these very things. They may not have the familiar vocabulary of, of an agile portfolio uh, program manifesto and safe in the whole book of framework, okay. but they are actually talking about uh, the fundamentals of yeah, how yeah. Do they really not, not at a specific yeah. uh, framework, but more towards uh, what you sort of told about. Yeah, I would I would recommend uh, take a look at those articles. Uh, this this gentleman, uh, I I am sorry, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Biane uh, Borganis. Uh, he's a VP at Stat Oil. His video talks are there on uh, on YouTube. Watch them, uh, and and you you'll get some good insights on that. Thank you. <coughs> Question is on appraisal system. So, any recommendation on what appraisal system Agile team should follow? Throw it away. Agile is a team game, and we still have individual appraisal system. Throw it away. I think throw it away. 
Uh, I, I'm, I'm extremely thankful to companies like Microsoft and Accenture for making a big deal of the fact that they have destroyed a payload system. For the last 30 years, we have been living with this, uh, with this uh, 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 irritant actually. Uh, it, it was overdue, their obituary was overdue and I, I'm happy that now that has finally happened. They will find some better way. We may not know. Again, we have to have an agile mind there. I may not know exactly what I'm going to do to substitute or replace it today because let's understand, every organization has a different context. We cannot, again, if, if, if I were to give you an answer and say, this is a template for run with that, this is going to be the appraisal tool auto, I think this would be as unagile as any of the agile processes that you and I know. Because then we are saying that people, chemistry and the context does not matter. Culture of the organization does not matter. We have this one size fit all template which now can go to anywhere, whether it's a high performing team that does not need controls or this is a team which has just come together and they are just trying to understand and form the trust circles, you will have the same way of doing it. It's like the agile process. You don't want to have the same agile process for both the teams. Both teams will discover. I want to believe that agile process is not something that you start with. Agile process is something that you end with. After a team has run its course successfully, after the people have come together and built equations of trust, they will create an, a process that will be agile for them. And that is what is agility all about. It's not about running with a standard process that says, this is agile process, come what may. Doesn't matter if you are a great superstar team or if you are a, a rookie team, right? So, that's it. Thank you. Okay, uh, I don't know, maybe if you have one more question, I'll be happy, otherwise I'll be more happy. You mentioned that um, when you were a manager and you were a manager, uh, handling a team of uh, some people and uh, at one stage of uh, you thought that uh, you will uh, be an individual contributor. Yes. So what actually inspired you and when you mentioned it actually uh, you felt more empowered. To be and honest, I, I wanted to get away from the pain of being a people manager. But that's a I selfish motive. But I mean apart from that what else? I mean, uh, you know, mostly people quantify their role or going above uh, in terms of that how many people you are managing? That's a problem. It's considered very sexy to have say, hey I was a manager, I was, I had 20 people under him and now I am a senior manager, I have 40 people under me. Whatever that under means, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's, it has to be your self-confidence that you can walk away from the fact that the symbols of power mean nothing to you. My, my, my ability to market myself in the job and move on to VP, VPs of organizations was not diminished an iota. In fact, I joined VP roles in most of the companies only because I was assured that nobody will be reporting into me. First of all, I was free from babysitting people. People have to be respected not to be, to not, they are not meant to be babysat, right? People are people, trust them, they will do the right thing, they create the environment. A leader's role is not to babysit and hand over people. We have to move away from this Indian mentality that unless you have 27 layers of hierarchy, we are not really doing anything. I'm, 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 I'm very frank and blunt on those things, but I, I believe the last 30 years of IT industry in India has, has screwed up the whole uh, 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 perspectives uh, for, a, for an entire generation for us. Where we have gone away from, from uh, what was the good old values of really what it takes to build a, build a work, great workplace to the power equations where we are saying, uh, so let me let me end that. I've run out of time, but let me just end that to, with you. Something which is very remarkable, which I learned from one of the great books. There is a book of, by, by name the Spider and the the Starfish and the Spider. I would recommend that anybody who is interested in building great workplace should read that. It actually talks about two paradigms where a spider, if you crush the head, dies because it's very centralized, and a starfish, if you cut off the limb, it regrows actually. So, so most of the organizations which are actually very successful are starfish than spider and they continue to thrive. And the author actually talks about one of the American Indian tribes, uh, the original tribes when the Spanish came, they were able to actually conquer most of the American Indian tribes, the Cherokees and the, uh, the Mohicans and everybody at some point in time. But the Apache Indian tribe was there which was eluding them for more than 200 years. They were just not able to get to Apache Indians. The reason they, the Spaniards were not able to do anything to the Apache Indians was because there was no leader. There was no concept of leadership in them. There was no concept of power. There was no concept of hierarchy in that society. And they were not able to, they, they would kill the Nantas, the, those spiritual gurus that they had. Another one would reappear. They would kill them. They were nomads. They would burn their homes and they would do that. They would go somewhere else and live there. How do you find somebody like that? Right? It's not something. And later on it's equally interesting what really happened 
Uh, and later on, uh, after Spaniards were not able to do, how did they really manage to break that society? It took them just 30 years to break the society that was already fighting for 200 years without any sophisticated weapons. All that it was gave them cows, literally. They gave them cows and cows became the power symbol for people. I have 20 cows, or oh, you have only 10 cows. You are a smaller chief, I am a bigger chief. They created a power hierarchy. They created an inequality inside a group that was always equal, egalitarian. Within 30 years, the, the whole tribe was finished. It's a great story, it's a great read. The more you read, the more you will appreciate that hierarchy and power has caused more damage to human society. And, and uh, I think we should go back to the fact, I have enjoyed it for the last seven years. Being without anything, I don't, have, I don't have to prove a point to anybody. I was able to walk away comfortably. I can walk into it any day, but I will never do that. In fact, I, I keep telling people I'm, I'm done with the cubicle business. So it's up to you, it's your call. I respect people who are in the cubicle business, but I respect people even more those who have taken the courage to get out of the cubicle business. Let me stop here, I think we have run out of time. Thanks a lot for your patience.